Yo, 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 what's going on? Happy Friday, happy Friday, happy Friday, everyone. My name is Justin Moore. I'm the founder of Creator Wizard, where I teach you how to find and negotiate your dream sponsorships. Excited to be back for another live stream. Uh, please drop it in the chat where you're tuning in from. I am going live across YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Twitch, you name it. Uh, I am what they call, what the youngins call multi-streaming right now. Um, so uh, today we're gonna be talking about summer sponsorship pitching strategies. And if you're thinking summer, Justin, it's April 21st. We're not even close to summer. Well, yeah, that's the point because the brands that are gonna be running campaigns in June and July are locking in those strategies right now. So uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about is how do you get on their radar? How do you reach out to them with a compelling pitch? Uh, how do you negotiate with them uh, and so on? But of course we also do Q and A, uh, your questions around sponsorship strategy and brand deals and all of that. Um, so make sure to stick around uh, there. And I just wanna give a quick shout out to, we got Lily Honey turning in, uh, pardon me, on TikTok. We got L Williamson 22. Christian Baker, 535. Good to see y'all here. Uh, and who do we got? Let's see right here on, uh, we got um, link, Lincoln.ch, I think it is. Uh, we got Biesis. Good after. What's going on? Uh, good to see you here. We got Modern Day Tech. What's going on? Uh, Eric. I think your name is Eric, right? If I remember correctly. Good to see you, dude. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We got Gil tuning in on LinkedIn. What's up, Gil? We got Kyle Dart. What's going on, Kyle? Good to see you. All right. So let's dive into some summer pitching strategies uh, right now. Okay. So uh, the first thing, uh, first recommendation that I have around summer pitching strategies is going back and looking at who you worked with last summer, right? Because the easiest way to convince brands, you know, convince these brands that you want to like partner with them is go back and see who you already worked with and, and basically tell them, hey, you should hire me again, right? And by the way, it doesn't have to just be brands that you worked with last year. You can go back to brands that you worked with over the holidays and pitch a summer campaign, right? So you go and you say, look, um, you know, the, the, the real big benefit of this strategy is that they already know you. They already have gone through the motions. Hopefully it was a good experience, right? It was relatively seamless. Um, and so you coming back on their radar, right? Brands are busy, right? Especially, you know, if it's a larger brand and they've got, or even a medium sized brand. And that person that you worked with has a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, you know, hats on, right? They're running paid ads. They're running, uh, you know, they're, they're doing Google pay per click. They're doing out of home, right? Maybe magazine conferences. Right. And so, um, this creator that they worked with, i.e. you six months ago, uh, is not on their radar on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it actually takes you reaching out and saying, Hey, you know, I absolutely love this partnership uh, that we did, you know, in, you know, November or October or whatever. Um, I have an idea for how we could activate this in a slightly different way. It's kind of just a quick pivot from what we did last year uh, and, and make this really applicable for, for some sort of late spring or summertime campaign, right? Um, and so they may be very receptive that, oh, I'm so glad you reached out. We're actually working on something right now. You'd be a great perfect fit. You'd be a great fit for it. Um, let, let's chat, right? Um, one of the things that I teach uh, in my Brand Deal Wizard program is uh, the importance of doing what's called a post-campaign report, right? And this is where you, you, uh, you know, collate a lot of the qualitative and quantitative data that you can glean from the campaign about why it was successful. So it's not just the views and the comments and the engagement and all that stuff. Like, yes, that may matter, especially if it's a brand awareness campaign, um, but there's all sorts of other qualitative feedback that you can provide, such as comments of people saying, oh my gosh, I did the thing, right? You told me to go like watch this, you know, movie, right? Or you told me to go, uh, you know, click on this link, or you told me to go purchase it or try a free trial or whatever. You probably have seen this, whether it's in your comments or maybe you've gotten DMs or emails or whatever it is, uh, you know, about this, uh, you know, particular brand or promotion that you did. Um, and then, you know, you can screenshot those and put those into your, your post campaign report and say, hey, look, like, remember this campaign that we did? You know, a lot of people ask me, like, how, how long ago is too long ago to submit a post campaign report. And I said, you can submit a post campaign report for a campaign you did a year ago. It doesn't matter, right? You could just say, oh, I was, you know, throwback Thursday. I was thinking about this, you know, awesome partnership that we did, you know, last year. I wanted to provide you some updated insights of how that, you know, campaign went. Remember how in the first like 30 days or 60 days that video got, you know, 5,000 views or 10,000 views or whatever. Guess what? Now has 50,000 or 100,000, right? You think they would love that update? They would love that update. And then you can use that opportunity to open a conversation for, for a summer campaign. 
We've got Max tuning in. What's going on, Max from Slav Guns? We've got uh, uh, Hanati from the KMH family. What's going on? Good to see you. Um, and uh, who else we got tuning in on Instagram? We've got Nick Hamilton. What's going on, Nick? Just had an awesome one-on-one -on -one with Nick uh, going over some sponsorship strategy stuff. So good to see you here, dude. Um, and uh, we got Frank's Chaos, Auto Wrecker 76. Uh, we've got uh, Flight Mode Music. Interesting, interesting username. I'm, I'm curious what content you create. Uh, so good to see y'all here. All right. So, um, so today we're talking about those of you just tuning in, we're talking about summer pitching strategies. Okay. The second strategy that I want to talk about is, is working backwards. Okay. So if you want to secure, let's say two brand partnerships for summer campaigns, let's assume that you're going to have a 10% success rate, uh, which is on the lower end. But again, like hang out with me, keep tuning into these live streams, live streams, I'm definitely going to get you a much higher success rate than that. Um, but uh, let, let's just assume, right? So you want to get two partnerships, you have a 10% success rate based on, based on your current pitching methodologies. Um, but for that to happen, of course, that means that you're going to have to pitch 20 brands, right? And if you're like, like thinking about this here, just from a timeline perspective, you don't have, you don't have that much time, right? Because if we're assuming that it takes on average, maybe a month, six weeks, even eight weeks sometimes to finalize the logistics of a partnership, uh, we're already looking at like, right? Like, what is that mid to late, like late May, early June, maybe to actually post the content, right? Something like that. So, um, you know, that's, basically the start of summer shopping for almost all brands. Maybe even a little, that's even a little bit too late, right? They want to get this live maybe in the next like three weeks, ideally four weeks, something like that, late May. Um, so you got to really get your act together, right? Like if, if I were you, I would spend the weekend, let's say, or spend the next, you know, three to five days strategizing, okay, what are the brands that I'm going to be pitching? And I would try to get these pitches out like next week, like ideally next week um, with the thrust being summer. Um, and so it's really important to kind of have this like, work backwards mentality when it comes to your your strategy because you cannot just pitch a brand for oh springtime right the snow is melting and everyone's like you know uh you know being out doing outdoorsy things now and wanting to buy you know shorts and t-shirts and all that stuff too if that's what you're pitching it's going to fall on deaf ears because they've already fully baked those campaigns like three months ago for most brands, right? And so it's just really important to understand how these things come together and how it works so that you're not just saying, oh, thanks, but you know, thanks, but no thanks, great, thanks for the note, or you're getting ghosted, or you're saying, oh, sorry, we're not working with any creators in a, in a paid capacity right now. That's why they're saying that to you, right? Um, we've got um, Mocktail Mom, what's going on, Mocktail Mom? Good to see you, we've got All In Records. Uh, good to see you, uh, Schm Schmunky. What a what an what a username Schmunky tuning in. Good to see you. Um, and oh, we got D and Fam in the chat. What's going on, D? Good to see you. Um, okay, so summer sponsorship pitching strategies. Okay, um, the third thing I wanted to talk about here is how important it is to survey your audience about what their summer plans are, well, maybe it's for travel or vacation or for road trips, or maybe they're staying at home, right? Staying at home activities. If you have kids, how are you helping them not regress during the summer with their education or something, right? And so if you can survey your audience, whether it's on your YouTube community tab or you're putting out a, a you know, a, a poll on Instagram stories or you're sending a newsletter, whatever it is, whatever your format is, if you're a podcaster, you know, click the show notes, et cetera, um, you can utilize the results of that survey to approach brands for creative ways to market to them. So, um, you know, just logistically, you know, if you, if you need to, you can incentivize your audience, maybe give them a Starbucks, you know, gift card or Amazon gift card, whatever. Um, but you know, you should be at like trying to learn more information. In fact, this should be a regular thing. Maybe something you do every quarter, every month. I don't know. Like you, you want to learn about the, the existing, you know, habits, and, uh, you know, pain points of your audience, right? And so if you can ask them these types of questions, you can even ask them about the brands and the products that they always buy every summer for them or for their families or for their kids or whatever. And you can use that as a list of brands to target, right? And so the, the beautiful thing about this strategy is that when you reach out to the brand now, you're not saying, oh, I love your brand. I use it every summer, right? Um, <laughs> you're saying my audience, like a, a, a segment of my audience really loves and uses your brand. So they already have authentic affinity. And so now the thrust of the proposal is I would love to expose your brand or your product to my full audience because there's already like some, you know, existing uh, interest from like a Porsche segment to cohort of my audience, right? Um, and so it's like, that's a very, very important 
like slight shift in your positioning when you're pitching brands because um, of course you have affinity, you wanna work with them, you wanna get paid. So you reaching out and being like, I love your brand, that's doing, it's not It's not adding anything to the pitch, right? But, it, but when you're saying, I actually have 10,000 people in my audience and I did a survey and there's already people who are like kind of interested in your brand, I would love to like pitch it to the full audience. Remember, your audience is full of your of this brand's pr perspective ideal customers. And that's what you want to illustrate to them, that you are the conduit to help them reach that audience of those customers, right? Um, and so uh, again, like even if nothing comes of your pitches, you now have a ton of valuable information about your audience, which can help inform your future content strategy, right? Oh, my, a big portion of my audience, they really like, you know, I don't know, like they really like uh, cornhole. <laughs> I'm making it over. Like they, that's what they do. They love doing that during the, you know, during during uh, the summer, or spring, whatever. Um, I'm gonna go pitch maybe outdoor games brands, or I'm gonna pitch, you know, uh, you know, summer backyard barbecue. Like if, if this is like the things that they're doing, you know, maybe maybe your audience they uh, like like let's talk about like household income. This is a really important uh, or, or just understanding the socio socio socioeconomic, um, like like uh, the, the socioeconomic. Uh, like makeup of your audience is very important because you probably know this. Like if you're if you're trying to pitch products or services or talk about things that are just totally outside the realm of their ability to afford that, then what the heck are you doing? They're not gonna they're gonna stop watching your content because it's not gonna feel relatable, right? And so, um, yeah, for the most part, like yeah, maybe you could argue like there are certain types of content where it's like voyeuristic, it's like or it's like vicarious. It's like oh, I want I want that one day or I want to be like that, right? And so they're they're consuming it for that reason. But most of the time, people are want to want to watch content that they can relate with, right? Um, and so. Like you don't, you want to be understanding like what are the pain points? Like what kind of jobs do they have? If you're comfortable asking about household income, like, you know, like, you know, put that into a survey and ask, ask them, you know, like to share that type of information about you. You know, it's under the guise of, I want to learn more about you audience. I want to learn, I can see the demographics. Yeah, I can see the, the you know, the G out where you live and I can see the ages and the gender breakdown and all that. So I can see that, but like, what kind of jobs do you have? Do you have kids? Like, you know, are you consuming my content in line at Starbucks for three minutes on, you know, every day? Or are you like sitting down every weekend and watching my last four vlogs for three hours? Like, how are you interacting with my content? Well, what's keeping you up at night? When you can learn about this information, which is the psychographics of your audience, it's an absolute game changer. I actually have a, a, a uh, uh, article, a, a very detailed article about the kind of whole psychographic um, exercise on my website, creatorwizard.com, um, which there's tons of articles on there. So if you didn't know that, you should go to creatorwizard.com and go check out the articles. Um, but you can definitely check that out if you want to learn more. Um, a Gil says, I love this survey idea. Even just a casual IG story asking people to write in their answer. Yes, exactly. You don't have to like make this complicated. IG story, hey, hit reply. There's a little box there. Hit reply to this story, whatever. Tell me, you know, like, like give me some insights here, right? Then you take, by the way, take screenshots of all those answers that may, you know, include brands or products or whatever, and you can utilize those in your pitches. It's not hard. We got the hustling mama tuning in. What's going on, uh, Rosie? We loving this energy for a Friday morning. Good to see you. Uh, li lift, laugh, Liz. Awesome. Good to see you here. Lift, laugh, Liz. Um, we've got LinkedIn users saying, Hey, Justin, I don't know who you are. Cause it doesn't say your name. Unfortunately, maybe you can tell me your name. All right. Before we dive into Q and a, uh, I just have a, a couple more things I want to talk about with respect to sponsorship, uh, pitching for the summer. Um, and, and the main like, like kind of final takeaway here is that, you cannot take no for an answer. I think that that's like one of the most fundamental things you'll learn uh, about my coaching methodology, my my kind of the tenets of my of my sponsorship strategy education is that you literally cannot give up. You can never give up. If a brand says no to you, it's not no. It's just not yet. They're not ready to partner with you for a variety of reasons. Most of those reasons probably have nothing to do with you, right? And so the, the name of the game is is what I call pivoting, right? If they say no, you're gonna pivot to something else. Uh, you know, For example, um, you're not just gonna immediately pivot to the next season because then you've like 
you know, you've closed the opportunity for you in this in this time window for for now, right? Because a lot of people will be like, uh, you know, they're saying, oh, you know, thanks, you know, we're not hiring any creators for any paid partnerships right now. Get back to us in like five months or whatever. So you, you don't say, okay, sounds good. Thanks for your consideration. Like, well, then of course you're going to get frustrated about this thing, and it's going to feel like you're getting rejected all the time. Your job is to then pivot to something else that could be relevant to them in that moment for a summer campaign. So if they say, oh, we're not working with any cam, you know, creators on any any partnerships right now. Um, you know, we, we've already locked in our partners, let's say for, for spring or summer. Then you say, oh, so, so awesome to, to, uh, you know, congrats. That's awesome. Um, are you able to share a little bit about your, your platform strategy? Are you primarily, you know, partnering with creators on YouTube or TikTok or, or podcasters or whatever? I just, I would love to learn about that. Right. And so if they're able to share that with you, then maybe you're able to identify a potential, you know, gap in their strategy. And they say, oh, we're, we're primarily focusing on like long form YouTube content right now. Uh, and then you're able to say, oh, okay, well, uh, that's so interesting. It, it seems as though you really value long form content. I'm not sure if you knew this, but I actually have a podcast. And I, I'm not sure if you've ever tried podcast integrations, but they can actually be very effective. I've been doing this for three years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So this is a, a very, you know, minor pivot. So this is something that potentially they could activate uh, very easily for this current campaign that they're maybe about to run or running soon, um, or, or maybe they're in the middle of that campaign and onboarding you, especially if they've worked with you in the past, onboarding you to try out this new type of tactic, uh, maybe something that they're willing to entertain. And again, it took you asking that extra question, asking about their strategy, actually act, acting interested in the outcome of this of this you know uh, this campaign that they're running for them to give you that that information. You may think. You know, brands are not gonna tell me this type of thing. Brands will definitely tell you this because it actually, you know, they're not gonna volunteer it to any random creator that, that reaches out, but they may just volunteer it to you, especially if maybe you're typing, you know, engaging with them over a LinkedIn chat or something like that. Like it's no sweat off their back to just ping you and be like, oh, you ask a question? Sure, yeah, I'll like yeah, it's kind of like this, right? So again, you know, you, you have to understand that they're not gonna give you this information unless you ask for it, right? Um, and so you just literally, cannot give up. So a lot of creators, they just send one pitch email, they don't hear back, and then it's just like kind of like a big blow to their egos. And you know, my my philosophy around this stuff is that you just cannot, you cannot take things personally, right? Any number of things could have happened to your email or to your pitch. Uh, maybe it got flagged as spam, maybe the contact opened it and they forgot to reply, maybe they were planning on getting back to you and they just got super busy, right? So especially if you're not hearing back, especially if you're getting ghosted, you cannot automatically assume the worst. You cannot turn inward. You cannot just be super low and be like, oh, my pitch has sucked, I suck, my content sucks, no one loves me. Um, don't, you gotta reverse that victim mentality and be like, no, you know what? Like this brand just doesn't know that yet that I'm the perfect partner for them. And I'm going to convince them, even if it takes two years, D actually D my, my head of community here in the chat, she is like the, the expert at this. Like she just has this philosophy. This just like, I don't know. It's like this fountain. I don't, I'm not even know where it comes from D, but she's just like, yeah, like I'm going to partner with this brand. Like it's me. If it takes five years, fine, three years, whatever. And so the, the, the beautiful thing about that, that mindset is that like you, you don't put this like huge amount of stress on yourself anymore, right? Cause you know, a lot of times people uh, are worried about pitching their dream brands because they don't want to screw it up. Um, but what you'll find is that, you know, oftentimes like it, it, it just, the timelines are not aligned and that's not, it has nothing to do with you. And so it's like, how do you stay on their radar so that when they do have that opportunity that slides, you know, through their inbox, they, you've been, you know, on their radar providing value for the last like year, uh, of course they're gonna think of you. How could they not, right? Um, so that's like a very, very, very important insight here. Um, the Hustling Mama says, no, it's not, no, no is just not yet. Yes, exactly, that's like one of my favorite Justinisms. I need to get a shirt that says that, right? All right. Okay, yeah, and D says, and when it aligns, it's going to be so freaking amazing. D, I don't know if you have, if you can share just real quickly the anecdote in your chat around, uh, you know, th this opportunity that you got. I think you said you nurtured it for like over a year, almost maybe two years or something, and you finally landed the deal um, because like that, that's amazing. This is the type of stuff that happens, right? Um, so that's amazing. All right, y'all. So we we were talking about summer pitching strategies, um, and now we're gonna dive into uh, some uh, Q and A. And I saw some comments here. I got a okay. So I got a question here from Robert Miller seventy eight. Do you think brands 
uh, care if you say you have a sponsorship, but it's really uh, an affiliate program. Um, okay, so I'm I'm not quite sure where you're going with this question. Are you saying that like other creators are being shady about this and they're like, oh, I was sponsored by this brand to try to seem more legitimate and then use that to try to get more partnerships? Is that what you're talking about? Um, I guess I'm really kind of uh, like wondering like what your main question is. Um, sometimes people are asking like how do you, like the disclosure aspect, like if it's an affiliate program, do I actually have to disclose? Like what do I have to disclose? Um, so maybe Robert, if you could like maybe clarify a little bit more in the chat, like specifically what your question is around that. Um, we got another que a question from Max here. Aren't most big brands already finalized with their budgets at least a quarter out or even uh, filled the the plans last year? Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of big brands, like the big, big brands for sure. Like a lot of times they bake their, but their annual budget, like the year prior, like, you know, so they're looking at, you know, in November timeframe, October, they're thinking about like the next fiscal year, not like, not the year starting in a month or two. It's like the next fiscal year. Um, so yeah, like a Lot, like imagine, okay, imagine you're a brand, a, a giant conglomerate brand like a, a car company or a, a conglomerate, a, a consumer packaged goods conglomerate like Unilever or P&G or something like that, right? And you are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on advertising. Do you think that it you can just take maybe two or three months to strategize to be able to de deploy that amount of capital? Do you realize how hard it is to spend that type of money to, to go out and find where are we actually going to spend tens of millions of dollars? Yeah, broadcast TV, but that's not enough, right? Now you need to be doing digital advertising, right? We need to be doing outdoor, you know, out of home uh, advertising, right? Uh, we need to be doing, working with, you know, partners, creators, sponsorships, like, you know, of events and like all, you know, athletes and like all this stuff, especially if you're a consumer facing brand. And so it takes a really long time to strategize how you're going to deploy that capital. Um, and so that's another reason why the larger the brand, the larger, the longer the lead time, right? Uh, now, that's not to say that brands sometimes do have, uh, you know, some discretionary budgets that they're able to activate on opportunities that present themselves that are that are more, uh, that are kind of uh, cultural moments or, you know, just opportunities that they can't pass up, you know, to be able to get their brand in front of, uh, you know, the right audience or something like that. Um, but, but generally your, your, your sense is correct, Max, which is that the larger the brand, the longer the lead time. And so, um, I will say though, that like, you know, the, the, the digital marketing budgets I have found, especially when it comes to working with influencers, especially for larger brands, um, you know, the, the planning process for those, um, tends to be a little bit less, like, like here, here's the, here's the, the real, here's the reality of it is that in the grand scheme of things, most brands, especially larger brands, the amount that they're spending on influencer marketing is just a drop in the bucket compared to where the millions and millions of dollars they're spending elsewhere on TV ads, on, you know, you know, true view ads on YouTube, like you name it. Right. And so it's, it's easier. It's easier to, so let's say that they're spending a hundred million dollars in a year or $10 million or whatever, probably like a couple hundred thousand of that right? Uh, if it's 10 million, but if it's a hundred million, maybe a million, 2 million, 5 million, whatever. It's, it's a small percentage of the overall spend. And so again, going back to the size of the spend, the less complex, you know, the, the, the smaller the spend, the less complex it is, right? Because let's say you have, you know, $200,000 to deploy on an influencer strategy, right? Well, if you want to work with, let's say mid tier or even macro creators, that may, may only be five partners, <laughs> right? Who are, you're each paying 20 to $50,000, right? you know, right in reality. Right. And so like the, the logistics associated of executing a campaign like that, um, are just going to be less, right? Because it's less partners, less money, et cetera. As it scales, it gets more complex as, as the platform strategy increases, right? You're working on multiple different platforms, uh, you know, activating long form content, short form content, like experiential, maybe there's like meet and greets with the creator, like, right. It's just like, as the complexity increases, the lead time increases. So, um, that that's generally kind of my philosophy here about how you, uh, can strategize. Right. And the other thing too, is that like, you can get a sense oftentimes of like what their playbook is. Just go and look what they did last year, especially larger brands. Oftentimes they're not reinventing the wheel every year. And so it takes you actually going in, digging into their past social media posts that they were making last year or their press releases that they were putting out last year, seeing the kind of campaigns that they're putting out. Um, like you can ed educate yourself or honestly, this is the thrust of what I teach in my brand deal wizard course. Like, like this is nuts to bolts, like thinking more strategically, understanding how you can 
come to a brand with a, a research backed, you know, pitch and proposal and help them understand like, wow, this person is not just another creator. Like, let's have a conversation with this person because they really seem like they're very attuned to either this, this niche or this industry or this particular platform. Uh, like we should have a conversation with them. Uh, right. So, so this, at the end of the day, like this is, if you, if this stuff massages your brain, if you like talking about this stuff, you should definitely join the wait list for my course, <laughs> branddealwizard.com. All right. All right. Um, oh, we got, oh, it was Patty. Patty, what's going on? Patty McGill. I was on LinkedIn, but my name didn't come through on the comment. Great session so far. Appreciate that, Patty. Good to see you, dude. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, D says, this opportunity uh, came in, this opportunity came in and it took months to go back and forth with negotiations and timing. Eventually we signed a long-term partnership and currently talking about our next partnership. Boom. D, I'm so proud of you. That's incredible. That's incredible. Um, Gil says, man, getting to learn from the sponsorship goat on a Friday for free. We love to see it. Yeah, exactly. Gil, I show up every single week for y'all because I love talking about this stuff. I don't care if you ever pay me a dime. Have I ever, have I told that? Have I said that enough? I literally don't care because I want, this is like my mission in life. I feel like this is like the next chapter for me, right? I have experienced, my wife and I have experienced so much success, and made so much money over the course of the last like 14 years being on, on social media that it's like, I really do truly feel like this is like my mission. Like it's, I, this is like my North star is helping y'all helping the next generation of folks, um, find their path and build a sustainable career. Like, l l let me just, can I just stroke my ego for just a second? I don't do this very often, but we have been full-time creators for like almost nine years now. We've been on social media, first YouTube channel, 2009. So 14 years, right? There is not a lot of creators that that can, that can say that they've done this consistently for nine years straight. Both of us, both my wife and I, our sole income basically for the family. I mean, I had an agency for a while, but like primarily like for nine years, we've been doing this full time. That's not by accident. That doesn't just, and we don't have 10 million followers, right? It's not like we have, we have, yeah, maybe about a million and a half, but we, we do not have a single platform that has over a million followers, right? So so you, someone could look at our business and look at me and be like, ah, it's easy to be a full-time creator. Like you have millions of followers. Like that's never been us. We've always been kind of solidly mid-tier, right? And so to be able to do that, to have the consistency of income, to have the diversified revenue streams, to build a process behind how you can maintain that full-time income for oh, almost a decade, that is not easy. And in fact, there's lots and lots of creators who weren't able to do it. They either burnt out, they couldn't handle the pressure of the content hamster wheel, um, which I understand. I get the burnout. We've been through that, right? Um, they they were, you know, had to go back, get a full-time job, which again, like I don't, I don't fault, right? But I'm just saying, like, this is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> like it takes a lot to be able to, to build a business, a sustainable business doing this. And so um, like, I'm not just making stuff up. Like, I, like it's taken a lot of trial and error, a lot of failures. And so that's why I'm here is to like, if you can avoid some of the mistakes that we have made along the way, like that makes me so excited and that would make me so happy. And so uh, I just wanted to, to say that because it's like, it, it's, it's a really important realization to have is that um, like, you can't just be like, okay, I want to go full time, but not have a long term plan. Like, yeah, you may have like a, a good amount of, you know, flow and a good amount of like deal, like, uh, you know, the pipe deal pipeline for the next three months. But what about after that? Like it, it, we literally my wife and I planned for years, literally years to be able to get to the point where one of us could quit initially and then for both of us to quit. Now all our eggs are in the same basket, which is terrifying, <laughs> especially when I quit, I quit my, my wife quit her job in 2012. I quit my job in 2014. And when <laughs> I had a six figure job in medical devices and when I told it, and told people, friends, family, like that I had quit my job to be a full-time YouTuber. They looked at me like I was nuts. They looked at me like I was clinically insane. Right. And so, but, but they didn't, what they didn't see was that in the background, my wife and I had been planning. We had made a plan that like, Hey, if we hit this certain amount of income, monthly income, incremental income above my nine to five salary that was paying health benefits critically, like all the stuff, right? The 401k, right? If I hit that threshold, I have to quit. Otherwise I'm never going to do it. I am literally never going to do it. 
right? Because it's so easy to just sink back into that comfort and be like, oh, the medical benefits and the reliable paycheck and like yada, 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 right? But if you want to do this, if you believe in yourself, if you believe in the business that you're, that you believe you can create down the line, you have to make a plan. I should do a workshop about this, about how to like create, like quit your job, how, how to like actually, if this is something that you want, what, what, how do you plan for that? How, like, what do you, what is, what do you have to figure out? What's the lead time? Like how long in advance do you need to start planning for this? Right? What do you need to do with your business? Like candidly, that's one of the goals of my, of my program of a brand deal wizard is because like for a lot of creators, sponsorships represents a very significant portion of their income. And so a lot of creators look at sponsorships and they're like, yeah, it's, it can be lucrative and you get, you know, good deals and all this stuff too. But like, you can't rely on that income because you never know when those deals are going to come. And my, uh, my thesis and, and, you know, basically what I, what I, you know, lay on the table to a lot of, you know, what I, what I thesis isn't the right word. My, what I posit to creators when, who, who believe this is like, that's actually false. Like brand deals are predictable, but you have to put a system in place to make them predictable. Right. And so that's the whole structure of the course and all that stuff too. Um, but it's like in, in general, like that's the, the I, I kind of look at this as like my Trojan horse strategy because people get into the program and we talk a lot about sponsorships, but we also start drifting into a lot of these other topics, right? Digital products and fan funding and merchandise and affiliate marketing and all this stuff too, because all those things represent uh, like your holistic business, right? And if you can have a, a very, a well diversified business, you can walk away from crappy deals at the negotiating table for sponsorships, right? And so it's like, it's, it, they're all kind of inner, interwoven, you know? And so we do, uh, that's like my, my secret strategy is like, I love getting people in here talking about all these other things because they all should work together, right? All right. I'm talking a mile a minute, so I'm going to take a swig. Oh, we got, um, <laughs> Rosie hustling mama says genuine gangsters <laughs> with some hand clap emojis. Thank you. Mocktail mom said that would be an awesome workshop. Good to know. Uh, lift laugh. Liz says that would be an awesome workshop. I'm going to take a screenshot of that. So I remember this because I say stuff all the time and then I'm just doing so many things that I cannot, I literally cannot remember all the, all the things that I talk about. So, um, oh, we've got Leia. We've got Leia in the chat. What's going on? Leia is an alum uh, of my brand deal wizard cohort uh, eight. So good to see you, Leia. Um, appreciate you here. Oh, we got Daniel Agachi in the chat here as well. Good to see you, Daniel. All right. Um, let's dive back into the chat because I, I think I'm missing something. Uh, okay. Well, we got some clarity here real quickly from Robert Miller, Miller, uh, Robert saying, saying that this video is sponsored by X. Um, got it. Okay. So saying that the video is sponsored by, so when it comes to like making it, yeah. So, um, that's not a sponsorship. An affiliate deal is not a sponsorship. That brand is not uh, like contract any, basically anyone, I mean, you have to be approved by their affiliate program essentially, um, to be an affiliate obviously, but then anyone can basically include an affiliate link in the description box. So it's not really a sponsorship. So, um, if there's creators out there who are like saying, oh, this video was sponsored by blah, 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 blah. That's not really an accurate, uh, like depiction or, or articulation of, of the nature of the partnership. If you look at the FTC, which is the federal trade commission in the United States, which is the governing body that, that mandates, you have to disclose the relationship with a partner or someone that may be compensating you. Um, to be clear, you do have to disclose that it's an affiliate link. So if you are saying, oh, I'm going to, you know, going to link a product below, like the thing that I'm using or whatever, you absolutely have to like disclose that next to the link. So it's very clear that this is an affiliate link. You may receive compensation if someone clicks on it and, and purchases, right? Um, but but you don't need to say in the video, this video is sponsored by X brand because it's not. It's an affiliate relationship. Um, if if the entire video is about one particular product and that, that brand is an affiliate, you may want to be a little bit more uh, up front in the video, maybe you verbally say, oh, and you know, and this brand is an affiliate. And so if you click the link, I may receive a commission, like et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's just like the, the FTC, what they say is that you just have to make it clear, right? They, they have some guidelines of how you actually disclose it, but like the, the major, uh, like guidance is just make it clear, make it clear. Like if this person clicks here and purchases that you're going to get paid for that, you're going to get a small commission. Right. Um, and so at the end of the day, that's, that's really my recommendation there. 
Shannon said, please make a video on this, uh, on the uh, kind of the quitting, quitting the nine to five thing. That's okay. All right. I'm getting some validation here. I'm getting some signals. So, so maybe something to think about. We got Joe Oates in the LinkedIn chat. Good to see you. Um, uh, Max, Max says, I haven't gotten a YouTube no notification about these streams in almost four months. I just saw it last night for the first time since then. I don't know why that is. That's so weird, man. YouTube doing me dirty. Um, good to see you here though. Um, we got a uh, fourth born child tuning in all the way from the Philippines. Good to see you. Um, oh, we've got, um, all right. Okay. Here we got some question question from Hushy here. Just worked with the developers of my niche video, a video game to create some, uh, how to content for new players coming after a marketing campaign. They're a small company. How can I go about working with them again at a larger scale? I think I did a good job. Um, so, uh, should I wait until the next big thing they're doing and ask, uh, what do you think? Should I also put myself out there for other brands? What sort of brands are interested in sponsoring a transport based video games? Uh, and, and would you, uh, would, would you be okay to give some examples? Um, Hushi, like I wish I could click. I don't know why I can't click on your channel because I would love to understand. What do you mean transport based video games? Are you talking about like Microsoft Flight Simulator? Is that what you mean? I'm just give me give me some more context of like what you're talking about here. Um, but I can I can talk more generally about um, you know how do you how do you parlay a successful partnership into something more more ongoing? Um, so so I, I think that's kind of the general gist of what you're asking. So. If you're a creator that just did a successful partnership with a brand and you're trying to figure out how to parlay this into something that's more ongoing, uh, there's a couple recommendations that I'll have. Number one um, is that the brand may be eager for you to pitch this, but they don't even know that you're interested in something like this. So it's up to you to actually reach out to them and be like, Hey, I would love to work with you on an ongoing basis. The brand may just think like, oh yeah, maybe they're just too busy. They don't really, they have too much going on. And I don't know if they'd be interested in working with us like every month or whatever, but here you are thinking like you'd be thrilled with that. And it actually took you reaching out, pitching a relationship like that for that conversation to start, right? I think a lot of creators think that, uh, you know, sponsorships and opportunities, it's always gonna come inbound from the brand or it's always, they, it, the genesis is going to be on their side. Like they're the one who has to like think up this idea and then they're gonna go reach out to you and pitch it. No, like you can reach out and pitch something that they never have really thought to do before, right? And so, um, you know, I think that, that that really is a fundamental mindset shift that you need to have as a creator that you cannot just, you should not just sit on your hands and wait for the brand to pitch something to you. You can pitch something to them and they, yeah, they may say no, we're not doing that right now, but it's interesting that you're pitching that because we actually are doing this other thing over here. And yeah, are you interested in that? Right. And so that's the other insight is um, the, the point of, of going back and pitching them some longer term thing, what you actually pitch them, they may say no to. In fact, that's probably the reality. They, they're probably going to like say no. Right. But, you know, give them the opportunity to surprise you and say, oh, um, well, yeah, we're not doing that. But how about this? Right. And then knowing you, you're probably flexible. You loved working with the brand. And so then and then that's basically the start of the conversation. Right. And I think that the other really big insight here, too, is that, um, you know, a lot of brands look at influencer marketing on a campaign by campaign basis. They still look at it as a tactic where it's like something you do usually once a quarter or maybe, you know, if it's a brand that doesn't do a ton of things, maybe once a year or something like that. But most brands don't think, oh yeah, we're going to do like influencer marketing, like on an always on basis, like every month, every week we're working with influencers. Now let's be fair. Let's, let's be, let's be clear. Like there are some brands where influencer marketing is like one of their primary marketing strategies. So those brands, they're doing that all day long. Maybe that's like 75, 80% of their, of their marketing budget is working with creators. So like a lot of like direct to consumer brands, like, you know, you know, brands that are kind of on the come up, they understand the power of like TikTok and like stuff like that. Right. But a lot of entrenched incumbent brands, uh, you know, the medium, size brands that, you know, traditional brand and you know, brands and traditional companies and traditional industries, um, that's not like on their radar. They're not doing influence marketing day in and day out. And so like one of the, the, the like, uh, mindset shifts you need to have around this is that when you pitch them an ongoing, uh, partnership, it has to be in a structure that they understand, right? So what are, what are the things that they're doing on a, on a monthly basis? Well, they're probably running meta ads. They're running Facebook ads, Instagram ads. They're probably running YouTube TrueView ads. Like they, they understand that, that, right? They understand that if they put $1 into the meta black box ad manager, they're going to get $3 out or they're going to get $10 out or whatever the, the 
you know, return on ad spend is for that tactic, right? And so they, they understand the need to like have consistent leads or whether they're trying to, you know, whatever type of company it is, whether it's, you know, e-commerce or CPG or maybe it's B2B or whatever, they understand the importance of like ongoing lead generation, right? And so maybe one of the strategies that you come to them with for this kind of ongoing pitch is, hey, let me help you make some more compelling ads. <laughs> we, we we have this great relationship. We did this awesome campaign. Yeah, I can cr I can create some con ongoing campaign that or content that I post on my channel. But really, like I think this might be interesting. I'm an interesting tactic to uh, you know use this content to run paid advertising and and you know integrate into your this other strategy that you're more comfortable with, right? And so I, I really I you know having empathy for the brand's comfort level and being able to pitch something that is just kind of a, a minor course to course correction to something that they could get improved internally, right? Imagine you pitch this to the marketing manager, you pitch this to the, you know, influencer partners, partnerships manager, whatever that person has to then go to their boss and say, Hey, Hushi just, just pitched this thing to us. And the boss is not going to be entrenched in partner partner marketing every day, like your contact. And the boss is going to be skeptical. They're going to be like, Hmm, I don't know. Like we, you know, we're spending a million dollars a month or $500,000 a month on, on ads. Like, I, I don't know. I just feel like it's a better use of our money to like spend it on ads instead of like paying more money that to that creator. Cause I don't know. It's just not, you know, we pay $5,000 to the creator. Like we're not going to, you know, we don't have that certainty that we're going to get $15,000 out the other end of that. <laughs> right. But when we, when we put that $5,000 in into paid ads, like we do have that certainty because we've been running ads for five years. So we know there's, there's some, some certainty there. Right. And so in that same scenario, right. Imagine that whole thing we just pitched your contact goes to their boss and be like, Hey, Hey, we just did this partnership. It went really well with this creator. And they have this really unique idea. We're running all these paid ads, but they said, Hey, they can create a bunch of content for us that we can use for ads. And then, and then the boss is like, Oh, that's a really interesting idea. You mean we can get some more efficient ad spend? Oh, that's really interesting. Let's talk about this. Right? So it's like, again, it's like putting putting your hat on of the brand, what's important to them. And I know I talk about the ad thing a lot, but like, that's just an example. There's other things too that brands care about. Oftentimes brands get really excited just about content. They're like, oh man, our blog sucks or our YouTube channel sucks or we don't have a TikTok or like whatever. Like some brands get excited about weird stuff. Oh man, we're not doing webinars right now. Could you do a webinar for us? Like you know, this type of like weird stuff. Oh, what's up baby? Dang, look at that outfit Why, for lunch. Hold on, hold on. What? Why he got a sign? <laughs> I do have the sign. I have the recording pro in progress. See, this is when I'm on calls or live streams or whatever. But see, she knows there's certain types of of signs. Come sit on my lap, baby. There's certain types of uh, of of like when I'm doing a webinar or something. Probably come here. Come sit on my lap. I wanted to show them what. Oh, 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 okay. Hold on. April, April's gonna do a modeling. Guys, hold on. Look, I got this on Amazon. Oh. Amazon. Do you guys like it? Uh, <laughs> I get to go out to lunch with this woman later. No, I'm going to tie my hair up because I have allergies in my hair on my face. It's just making it all red. Mm. But I yeah, I, I, haven't seen that one I just bought it. for, mm. And it's like casual. You can wear it with like sneakers. Mm. I'm going to wear it with sneakers. Can you come sit on my lap for a second? <laughs> <laughs> do you guys have any idea how lucky I am? Mm. <laughs> I got to do... I have allergies, so my face looks weird. Mm. Hi, friends. How are you? We're talking about summer pitching strategies. Mm. Oh, oh, Gil. Oh. Who's Gil? He said too. He or she said too much fineness. <laughs> That's my friend Gil. Hey, Gil. <laughs> What's up? Gil, she's taken. She's mine. I'm taken by Creator Wizard. Mm, by Creator Wizard. Exactly. We could be friends, Gil. Excuse me. <laughs> just kidding. Excuse just kidding. Me. <laughs> That, that content is paywalled. <laughs> I was kidding. It's an inside joke because one time I was at the gas station and this guy was like, hey, girl, what's up? And I was like, oh, I'm taken. And he said, nah, we could still be friends. That and is I was so like, ratchet. I oh said, boy, God. we cannot. We cannot be friends. Anyways, just want to say hi. I'm going to go finish getting ready. I have a sponsorship. I'm going to Costco because I have a sponsorship. Yes, we love it. Yes, we love a sponsorship. Okay, love you, friends. Love you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Thanks for showing it all. Dang. Oh, yeah. Did you like it? I really, oh, <laughs> <laughs> dang. <laughs> I got an even better show. Thanks, boo. All right. 
my goodness. Um, all right. Oh, Gil says too much fineness for one live stream. Oh, I meant the both of you. Thank you, Gil. I really, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Oh my God, uh, Jessica. Oh, Jessica, what's going on? Jessica Thorpe says, you guys are so sweet. Thank you. Guys, if you're not following Jessica, she is the president of Gen Video, like this giant influencer uh, platform, like company agency. You guys should go follow her. She she's uh, has a lot of really interesting insights to share. Uh, so good to see you here, Jessica. Thank you. Um, we've got some, oh, got some dead emojis in the chat, uh, from, from Rosie. <laughs> oh my gosh. Good to see you. Uh, we got Molly Modizzle on Instagram. What's, uh, what is a, what is up? Good to see you here, Molly. Um, Hushi says that's so wholesome. Yeah. So Hushi, I, I know we were just talking about all this stuff. Hopefully that's like kind of what you had in mind, what you were, um, like, you know, kind of the thrust of your question. Um, all right. Um, let's see. Question from oh, question from Gil here. Um, any advice for how to get a repeat sponsorship when the initial campaign didn't perform amazingly? Perhaps because it was short form. This next one would be long form, which would get many more views. Got it. Um, whoa, that's a very loud. I thought it was like thunder for a second, but it was a motorcycle. You probably didn't hear it. Um, okay, so uh, let's talk about this. So. What do you do when you do a partnership with a brand and it doesn't go very well? Maybe it doesn't get a lot of views. Uh, not a lot of people click the link or no one purchases it or no one signs up for a trial of it, whatever. Um, and then here you are with egg on your face and you're be like, oh my God, this brand hates me. There's absolutely no way that this uh, they're ever gonna wanna work with me again. I suck, right? That that's that, This happens, right? I understand. Uh, the first challenge though that I wanna give you about this is that um, oftentimes, you think it didn't go well, but the brand is thrilled. They're over here being like, wow, this content was awesome. Like, thank you so much. Um, but they're not telling you that. It actually takes you reaching out to the brand and saying, hey, how do you think the, the campaign went? Most creators don't have the humility to be able to ask this question. But in my experience, it's this, it's this question being able to go back after a campaign, even if you didn't think it went well, and knowing that you're either going to win or you're going to learn. Either the brand is going to say, we're thrilled, this campaign was awesome, thank you so much, or they're gonna say, it didn't go so well. And then you can say, oh, well, thanks so much for sharing that with me. Can you give me some more information about why you think that is? Like why, like, you know, give, like how many people bought it? How many clicks did you get? Because you know, that sometimes there's not a lot of transparency. Like you may not have a dashboard, an affiliate dashboard or, or whatever. You may not know how many sales you generated, right? Um, and so you're left like, with a pessimistic viewpoint about it because, oh, then not, there's not that many views relative to my organic content or, you know, not many comments or whatever. And so you just, you just have this gut feeling like, wow, this didn't go well. Right. But then you reach out to the brand and they say, okay, it didn't go well. And so you say, oh, well, thank you so much for sharing that. And then you go back and you figure out why the heck that is. You go back and you think, okay, like maybe I didn't like execute this, this, uh, you know, this integration very well. You'll go back and say, well, you know what? I, I could have like been a little bit more effective about the, you know, talk about the features and benefits. Maybe I could have shared a case study of, you know, how this product has helped another consumer or helped another creator or helped, a, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, maybe I could have, you know, I didn't done the call to action a little bit better. I could have like put the, you know, an overlay text on the screen with my promo code. Um, I could have given the brand some insights into how the, the landing page could have been improved. Um, this is something I talk about in, in week three of my course. Um, so, so it's like, there's all these levers uh, of, of how you can improve sponsorships. In fact, if you want to uh, like, like nerd out about this topic, I actually did a live stream last week called seven sponsorship conversion tactics so that brands hire you again, because there's this whole other area of uh, sponsorship optimization uh, where it's like, how do you actually, once a brand actually hires you, how do you, how do you make sure that you actually sell the thing or drive the awareness or de deliver the content that they want you to. Right. Um, and so we, we did a whole live stream all around this topic, um, but just shelving that for a second, um, then you go back and you do this own kind of internal analysis of, of how you could have improved. And then you go back and you provide that, that insight to the brand. You say, Hey, like I acknowledge this did not go as well as I hoped it would have gone. Here is why I think that is. And you give them a breakdown. You say this, 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 and then you, and then you literally pitch them on the next idea. You say, Hey, you know what? Um, I still, I'm still, I still really believe that, um, there's, there's a lot to work with here. And here is how I believe we should have, we should, um, you know, approach the next partnership. We had a lot of people in the comments saying, Oh, like, I wish you would have talked about that feature a little bit more. Well, that can be the focus of the next 
piece of content, right? Or, oh, um, you know, this product is too expensive. Like I, it's, I'm, it's not affordable for me, um, blah, 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 blah. So maybe the next piece of content is talking about how, uh, you know, they're gonna get a massive return on investment. If they invest in it now, yeah, maybe a high, uh, you know, upfront investment, but over the course of seven months or eight months, you're gonna make all, back, back all that money. In, in, in sales and copywriting psychology, this is called overcoming objections. And you have to do this in your sponsorships too. You have to think, what are all the object, uh, perceived objections that either my audience has told me or preferably you actually envision and think about this prior to making the content. You think, okay, what do I anticipate like people are going to say about this, <laughs> right? You you probably know this happens, right? You, you do a partnership and then people in the comments say like, I'm not going to buy this because of X, right? And so sometimes you can like, anticipate what they're going to say. Oh, it's going to, it's too expensive or, uh, oh, I don't think this is going to work for me. Or I've tried that before. And you know, I wasn't thrilled with the outcome or blah, 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 blah. There's all these objections that people can have around products, services, buying anything period. Right. And so your job as a creator, as a salesperson, as a spokesperson is to get better at this, get better at anticipating that, um, in advance, you know, creating the content so that you're overcoming those objections. Um, and so, uh, you know, kind of to, to back up to Gil's original question around like, how do you, uh, like pitch the brand on doing this again is that you have to have a conversation and, and help them understand that like one data point is not a large enough sample to, uh, you know, determine whether this partnership between me and you, between me creator and you brand, uh, it, that's not enough. Like you, you have, there's, there's a couple other touch points that we need here, multiple touch points. Number one, that's going to allow me to continue to illustrate uh, to my audience that I'm continuing to love and use the product. Like there's this whole thing that we talk about in my course called the marketing rule of seven, right? Which is this maxim developed by the movie studios in the 1930s of, of how many times it took someone to hear about a movie before they went and got their butt in the seat, right? And so the same philosophy applies to sponsorships, right? That you have to be able to like expose your perspective, these prospective customers, your, I, your audience to a message. And so you have that conversation, you educate the brand around why this just doing a one one-off transactional thing is not going to drive the results that you're looking for. Right. Uh, and so just like leaning into that uncertainty, leaning into the potential that this campaign did not go well and being able to like articulate to them why doing this other approach, Gil, you mentioned like doing, you know, this was short form. Here's why we should do long form or here. This was short form, but I actually think that we can continue to do short form, but we should execute it in, in the following way. That's different. Uh, and here's the, the, the reasoning behind that, right? Oftentimes, like that's all it takes is like being able to have a well-reasoned justification behind your logic instead of just being like, oh, let's try it again. Like we, we just need to talk about it again. Like that's not enough. You have to like take that extra step um, and help the brand understand why they should be paying you more money when it when in reality it seems like it didn't go well initially, right? So yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Oh my gosh, I've been feeling talking a mile a minute. How do these live streams go so fast? I really, I don't, I always say that, but I never quite comprehend how, how quickly they go because it's like, they just fly by. All right. Um, okay. Uh, I, there was another question I think I missed. Um, where did I miss? I think it was on, uh, IG. Where was it? Uh, 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 um, here it is. Okay. We got a question here from Flight Mode Music. What is the best way to come up with prices? Okay, so I was actually on a uh, podcast monetization roundtable yesterday. So it was like a webinar. Uh, I was on on there with some other awesome creators. Uh, and this this actually a very similar question came up. And I'll, I'll share with you what I shared with, I think there was like almost 100 attendees. I think it was a lot of people. I'll share with you what I shared yesterday, um, which is that, I think for a lot of people, this is a very unsatisfying answer. A lot of people want me to tell them there is a formula, right? Oh, it's a percentage of your audience size and your engagement rate. And it's like, blah, 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 blah. Um, when in reality, pricing is an art and a science. I, uh, you know, go into a lot of detail uh, in a lot of my content, like my free YouTube videos, articles, and so on about the number one thing that you need to, to understand, which is what is the brand's objective, right? Because your pricing has to change based on the brand's objective. So there's three campaign goal types. Number one is a conversion campaign, right? This is where a brand wants to drive a measurable outcome, sales, clicks, you know, trial signups, app downloads, et cetera. The next one is content repurposing. And so this is where a brand wants to actually hire you uh, to 
get this awesome content that you can create for them that they can post on their social media or their website or run for paid ads or whatever. And then the last campaign goal type is a brand awareness campaign. And this is where the brand just wants to get the word out there. They want to get grassroots support. They're launching in North America when they're previously, they've just been in Canada or Australia, UK or something. Right. Um, and so partnering with you, uh, is an important, like, you know, step to <clears throat> make that happen for them. Right. And so you have to be asking the brand, what is your objective? Because if a brand tells you that, Oh, like sales. That's all we care about. Conversions. Like how many sales are you going to drive for us? Then it's going to be really hard to negotiate with them because they have some very, very dialed in metrics on their back end of like, hey, like the, the max we're going to be willing, willing to pay Justin is 500 bucks because we're expecting based on his viewership that we're only going to make $500 back. And in fact, they don't just want to make break even. Why would they do that? Cause then they would, they wouldn't have to go through this whole trouble of working with you. If they're just going to break even, they want to make profit. So they want to, you know, probably get a two X return. So they want to make a thousand bucks if they pay you 500. Right. Um, and so this is like a very, very important concept to understand is that to not get frustrated around conversion focused campaigns. Um, if you're trying to negotiate, because this is the reason they're being so stingy, basically, right. Contrast that with a brand awareness campaign where the brand doesn't have those same type of metrics. It's squishier, it's views, it's engagement, it's comments, it's this type of thing. That's what they care about. Because again, awareness, that is what they care about. Um, then, uh, like your pricing should be much more aggressive. A quick anecdote about this particular, uh, like situation. I had a, a, a call with a brand and, uh, you know, this is a creator economy company whose ideal c customers are creators, right? Business minded creators who are trying to di diversify their audiences and they want to partner with creator wizard with me, with my company, uh, to help them spread the word. Right. And so I have a lot of different channels. I have a lot of different ways, uh, not YouTube channel. I'm talking about like a lot of different avenues for them to partner with me. Right. I've got my YouTube channel. I've got my newsletter with almost 23,000 creators on it. Now I have a private community. Uh, I have, uh, you know, my pot, my new podcast, I have short form content, right. Instagram, TikTok, etc. Um, I've got like a lot of things that I, that I do, right? Uh, I have my course, right? I partner with brands in the course too, right? So there's a lot of different ways in which I can serve brands. And so when I have these conversations with brands, I ask these questions, the things I'm telling you right now, this is not rocket science. What I am telling you to do, I do myself, right? Um, and so I just ask these questions and I, I listen. I, I, they say, and they told me on this call that brand awareness is the most important thing. They want, um, you know, their, their, their primary goal is to, uh, you know, ensure that creators know that their company is a avenue to help them monetize their creator business basically. Right. Hopefully I win the deal and then I'm, I'm able to come back on a live stream in a couple weeks or a couple months or something and tell you this was the brand that I was talking about on that live stream. Um, but because they're great, like I'm really excited about the potential. Um, and basically like, uh, you know, I took all that data, I took all that feedback and then I designed my proposal, a fully customized proposal around that objective. Right. And so since brand awareness is their thing, I'm recommending things like exposure on my website, right? In a partner's section, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, you know, giving them opportunity to be on, on my podcast. I'm giving them opportunity to be in my integrated into my YouTube videos. Like, you know, obviously the newsletter can be a part of that overall play, but it's like I emphasize certain activations types for the different objectives. And so the pricing is in alignment to that. Right. And so I think that that's like a, a, a really, really important thing. And so to answer your question about how do you price and all that stuff, too, I have developed a very robust calculator for my courses and things like that, too. But the caveat that I always give to my, my students is that it's a baseline. Right. You can. Yes, it can be helpful. And and, and really what what is the most important thing there is not only understanding the objective of the brand, because it's actually in the calculator, like what is the brand's objective? Right. Um but like your, your, uh, your impressions and your reach and, uh, your opens, like those are the things that establish, like, like go into the baseline, right? Because you're, 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 you probably know like your followership, your subscribership is completely irrelevant, right? You could have two creators that you line up back to back. One has a hundred thousand subscribers, one has 10,000 and they get the same average viewership. And so it's the average viewership that really you should be utilizing as your baseline. Um, and then you're, you know, you can do the calculations. And then the other thing too, is that like, there's these really important levers that, uh, <laughs> you can't discount, which is exclusivity is the brand saying that they, uh, you know, you can't partner with their competitors for a certain duration 
Also, what's the category of exclusivity, right? Like Hushy, I know you said transport video games. Like, are they saying you cannot work with any other video game developers for the next 12 months? That's probably not a deal you're gonna wanna to, want to, want to take. Or if you do, you better be charging a pretty penny Contrast that with if they said, oh, you can't work with any transport video game companies, right? With that, that limits it, right? Uh, I know your content is focused on that, but like, again, it's like, you have to understand like, what is your content niche? Like if you're agreeing to this partnership, is it gonna be excluding you from a potential, a lot of potential deals down the line? And then usage rights, right? Does the brand wanna repurpose your content? They wanna run paid advertising with it? If so, for how long, right? The, these are like some very basic, uh, like things to consider during your pricing. So. Um, Again, I, I preface this by saying like, maybe this is not a super satisfying answer, um, but it's the correct one. And I would be, it, I would be doing a disservice to, to the, the creator that asked the question, but all of y'all, anyone listening, I would be doing a disservice. It was like, oh, here's the formula. Boom, here, do it, right? Because that, like you are going to be leaving so much money on the table and you're gonna be establishing these really, really tricky price precedents with these brands and these agencies that are going to be really difficult to get out of. So I really, really encourage you to take the path less traveled. You're here, you're on this live stream, you're educating yourself. And so that's the first step, right? But it's like, if you want to get better at this stuff, if you want to go full-time as a creator, if you want to go from like a thousand to 5,000 or $10,000 deals, it's not five or 10 times the amount of work. Trust me, there's so many other negotiation levers that you can uh, that you can play with when you're negotiating with these brands. So um, yeah, the, the, the long answer, the short answer is, uh, you know, it's based on the brand's objectives, but the long answer is it's an art and a science. There's all these different factors that goes into it. And really every single deal that you do is gonna be different, which is why, as my parting note to you, if you have a pricing page in your media kit, delete it immediately, okay? <laughs> We're at time. Crazy, right? Uh, Bree from Need the Recipe says, perfect answer, Justin. I appreciate that. Molly says, I asked a brand uh, their goal once and they said sales and convert sales and awareness. Any tips on how to negotiate from that answer? Well, Molly, what you say to them is, um, oh, hey, baby. Oh, Hi. oh, she's back. Hello, I'm back. She's, she is, is this the, the, the final look? I'm back. I'm back because I'm finna get my husband now. So oh. yeah, <laughs> I was just about to sign off. So I was <laughs> um, real quickly, Molly, the, the real thing to say to them, if they're saying it's both sales and awareness is it can't be both. You, you, we can do multiple campaigns where the, we have different goals, but it can't be both, right? The, the way in which I'll execute the content from a conversion perspective will be like, click the promo code Molly20 for 20% off your first purchase. That's a conversion campaign. But an awareness campaign is like, oh, this is the product, here's the outcomes, it's gonna be this and this and this. And you may not even give a, you may not even give a promo code or even tell them to click any link because that's, that's an awareness campaign, right? So it's like having that conversation and helping them understand that. Well, thank you all so much. Oh, 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 April's gonna, oh, okay, okay. okay. April's gonna end it. Come here, baby. So with that said, collect your checks. <laughs> I'm going to pretend to be Justin. Is that how I sound? With that said, everybody, know your worth. I'm the sponsorship coach, and I'm here to help you get that bag. Don't be... <laughs> what are y'all saying to me? Love, love these commercial breaks. <laughs> <laughs> I love that's you, a, Rosie. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, that's period, exactly. poo. Yeah, it's a commercial break. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love you, Rosie. Oh my God, my April, the April commercial breaks are the worst. Huh? I'm crazy. <laughs> no. You guys, oh my goodness. But yeah, uh, speaking of which, I do have a commercial I'm filming today. Actually, it's not a commercial, but it's a sponsorship. Yeah, so we excited about that. Yes, um, make it happen. Yeah, I tied my hair because my allergies. Mm. You guys, I got Justin a hot tub for his birthday. Oh. Yeah, it's coming up in May. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God, I'm so excited. We chatted with uh, our contractor friends and they're gonna pour the concrete and all of that. We're mm -hmm. done with business talk. We're talking about life now. Oh, okay, we're talking about life Yeah, now. so everyone's gonna leave now because we're just, <laughs> life is lifing our, uh, our dishwasher broke. Our dishwasher, no, I fixed it. Oh, you did? I think I fixed it. Did Ooh, you see? Oh, no. you like that? Oh. <laughs> we love our that handyman. That doing, you doing something for you? Yeah, oh. we love our handyman. Okay, fourth born child, you, I know you love to see it. Every time I do something like handy like that, I'm April, like, ooh, April we love Bob good. the Builder. April's like, oh, you're so good at that. <laughs> 
We do it's love like a Bob the to, Builder. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Ooh. Oops, sorry. Oh. Yeah. So anyways, friends, um, I'm going to go have a great day. Yes. Um, yeah. Si sign up to Creator Wizard. Subscribe. You know, what else, baby? What else you guys? Um, Find me on. newsletter. Newsletter. Oh, join just his newsletter. Creatorwizard.com slash join. Yeah. And on top of that, follow me on Instagram because I don't go on here just all willy nilly yeah she gotta get the call the collab come on. plug come on i'm collabing with my own man follow me <laughs> april athena 7 on tiktok instagram youtube thank you bye friends <laughs> <laughs> all right guys see y'all next week uh it's gonna be a fun one next week have a wonderful weekend and i hope oh okay real quickly um show up next week because if you can uh because i'm gonna be talking about a pretty significant structural change that i'm gonna be making to brand deal wizard which will make it more accessible, uh, both from an investment perspective as well as a knowledge delivery perspective. So I'll be a little mysterious and leave it at that. Uh, but if you can show up next week, same time, same place, Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, I would love to see you because I, I, I'm, I'm gonna kind of reveal behind the scenes of like this kind of big change that I make into the program and I would love your feedback. I want The reason I'm doing the live stream is I want feedback. So uh, would love to see you there. Have, you, have a great weekend, y'all, and I'll see you on the flip side.